All right. We're good? Yep. All right. Thanks. Let's get started here. Cool. Uh, so I'm Jacob Rossi. I'm an engineer on the team that builds the rendering engine uh, for formerly Internet Explorer and now our new browser, Microsoft Edge. Uh, so I'm usually uh, at events like these and conferences giving more uh, technical, deep, let's learn a new standard, let's build a cool thing. In fact, you can check out, like, I was at HTML5 DevConf once playing with leap motions and all kinds of other cool stuff. So, uh, yeah, check out that talk. Um, but today, I'm going to give you a little bit of a high-level overview of um, this new browser. It's the f one of the, you know, first new browsers in quite a long time, uh, and uh, I want to tell you about how we built this. I started at Microsoft when like this was the trending meme, and uh, and actually like um, that's kind of how I started at Microsoft. I was a I was a web developer. I was a Firefox fan at the time, and uh, I actually thought I was landing a web development job at Microsoft. And they said, "Let's go work on this browser," uh, and I was like, "I use Firefox," and um, and they're like, "Exactly." Um, uh, so so that's how I started my journey at Microsoft. Um, and you know, it's always I always hated this this uh, this term browser wars. You know, it was always you'd go to conferences and it was a panel and they'd stick me next to a guy from Google and a guy from Mozilla and a guy from Apple and we'd you know supposedly duke it out even though we're all just going to go get a beer afterwards. Um, it it kind of sets up this thing that we're like fighting against each other, right? And we have all kinds of these, right? Um, this is the latest one, right? It's it's. Web versus nat native is native apps killing the web. Or is the web gonna, you know, surface up and and take over? Um, we have other wars like holy crap, how many frameworks are fighting at each other right now? Um, and they're in and you know, what it makes me realize is we're distracted, right? We're like totally just missing the boat. <laughs> uh, and and. You, know, you have to ask yourself, wh why do we want the web to win? Why do we love the web? Like, what we we've missed, we've lost sight of like what it is that the web has that is particularly uh, advantageous, right? Um, so it's like maybe this is how you I would envision myself coming into you know the new team building uh, edge, where we we kind of took a look outside of the you know infighting and stuff that's going on and 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 figure out like how we can build a browser that's centered around. Uh, the web and what makes it awesome, because um, it does actually have some unique strengths. Uh, it, it has a lot of qualities that app platforms don't, um, and, and and these are actually I'm totally stealing this, and this is kind of awkward since uh, the, considering the building we're in. This is from uh, some of the Blink engineers actually came up with this uh, list of um, things that are unique to the web that don't particularly pertain to uh, app platforms as much, right? L the linkability of the web, the searchability of the web, the ephemerality, the fact that we just like browse you know, hundreds of sites in uh, a week's time, whereas we probably installed a couple apps this week at best. Um, how many of those do you actively use? Um, and, and then there's this interoperability factor, right? The fact that I can write code and, and deploy it where it runs on, you know, five major browsers, it runs on different platforms, operating systems, devices. Uh, and of course, then there's the openness factor, right? Like, I can go view everybody's code. I can, um, you know, most of these sites are all publicly available. Um, and so, when you think about that, it actually is kind of interesting. You can map some of this to how we prioritize features in our new browser, uh, Microsoft Edge. Uh, you know, from the linkability and networking aspect, the graph aspect, aspect of, the, of the web, there's, we added this cool feature where you can, you can actually like ink on a web page or draw or type notes and share it and send with friends. And, and, and we're, um, we're integrating Cortana into the browser where you can search faster and you can access this, this 33 trillion you know, node network um, in a much faster way. Uh, you know, you are going to find a hundred different Reddit links that you're going to go click, and you're not going to have time to read them all. And so we've built in a reading list where you can save them and come back to them later, even maybe offline in the future. Um, uh, and then what I focus on at Microsoft are really these last two, because um, I build the rendering engine uh, with a team of really awesome engineers back in Redmond. And we were focused on this aspect of making sure that the code that you write 
works in all browsers. Uh, and as a part of that, making sure that you're equipped to know how we're building our engine and where we're going and be more open about that, which we didn't do a good job of in the past. And, and so I'm going to talk a little bit more about these two things. And it starts with a really lame pun, um, but we forked. I don't know if you know this story, but like this is how we started uh, our new browser. Was we actually took uh, the rendering engine from Internet Explorer 11 and we forked it. Uh, and uh, we did a whole bunch of other stuff I'm going to talk about in a, in a second. Um, but we split this engine into two uh, so that we could separate ourselves from the legacy of Internet Explorer and really build a modern re rendering engine for a new browser that we would eventually come to call Microsoft Edge. Uh, so I'm going to play like a really interesting video. <laughs> no, this, this, I think, sets the tone pretty well. So let's start with this. I think we're really at an inflection point for the web. Looking back, a major new browser only comes out every five to 10 years. And for Microsoft, we've only had one, and it's been around for 20 years. We realized that it was very, very hard for us to make an engine that would stretch across 20 years of content on internets and on the open web. So that's why we decided to split the engine and have an older engine for content made only for IE and a newer engine that we can always keep up to date for the open internet. IE has been the browser used through the decades by millions of people around the world. And with the new rendering engine, that lets us sort of clean shop. It lets us get rid of the old things that were from the past that might have haunted web developers today. So the first thing I think that hits you when you come to work on a web browser is the scale of the problem. You learn that the web is 44 billion websites. And then you start to think, OK, I, I can't cover 44 billion websites, so we need to start to prioritize. In the past, the Internet Explorer team always tested against the top 10,000 sites or top 9,000 sites. We had a metric that we used to basically say that we are as compatible or more compatible than we were in the previous release. It turns out that's not enough. It turns out that the tail of the web matters. The rest of the web is gigantic, and people go to very, very different sites. So we got a lot of bug reports from people close to Microsoft and people all over the world where their local school website wouldn't work or their barbershop website wouldn't work. And these are sites that would never be in the top 9,000. So just focusing on the top 9,000 doesn't give you a browser that works for everybody all the time. So what we decided to do instead was use the crawler to detect patterns that exist in the tail of the web and in the head of the web. We crawl millions of URLs every night, and the Bing crawler itself crawls trillions of URLs monthly. As we crawl the web, we fix patterns instead of sites. And by fixing patterns, sites just end up working. So even though we're never going to be done with compatibility problems, I think what we've done in this release with the engine split, bringing up the new rendering engine, is we've really laid a foundation and a set of uh, best practices and, and engineering processes on the team that's going to really allow us to evolve more quickly and react in a much more agile way to compatibility issues and get them fixed out for our, our users and developers in a more timely manner. We're not abandoning standards. In the past, we had a very spec purity approach, and that really isn't the best way to do it. You have to be a little bit more pragmatic when you build a web browser. But you also have to work with the other browser vendors and with W3C to ensure that the specs accurately reflect what old browsers do and what web developers want to do. Project Spartan Journey has been about sharing our plan, what we're building, why we're building it, and what we're going to build next earlier than ever before. We launched our platform roadmap, which developers can know what standards we're looking at. We launched User Voice, where they can provide ideas and vote on what should be next. We are active in Stack Overflow on GitHub and on Twitter, seeking feedback daily. This is very much a community process, and we want to take the feedback from developers and users to help shape the product well before it ever ships. Evergreen is really about acknowledging that the web is this constantly evolving thing. You need a web browser that also moves at the speed of the web. And with Windows 10 as a service, we're going to be able to evolve Project Spartan at the speed of the web. In the five years that I've worked on the browser at Microsoft, I've not seen as much innovation and dedication to the products as in this release. We fixed over 3,000 issues. We've implemented over 45 different new standards. The pace of development here is impressive. 
I'm really proud of that, and I can't wait to see where we go next. So uh, hopefully you got two important takeaways from that. One, I used to have a beard. Uh, and two, we walk around the halls of Redmond with, in slow motion with like code floating behind our heads, and it's all super futuristic. Um, actually, when they asked me to like, uh, participate in this video, they were like, we need some code. Like, it needs to look real. And I was like, hey, I got an idea. That code is actually IE10 source code. Uh, so uh, yeah, it, and it didn't even crash the video. Um, <laughs> Now, I, I realize here that uh, I am living on the edge, literally, because I'm running like last night's build of Windows. So we'll see what happens. Um, so yeah, so the key focus here about the rendering engine was interoperability. And I want to kind of dive into what that means. Um, it's kind of a buzzword from that video. Let's make it real. Uh, this is about what it looked like. This really resonated with me when I started as a web developer at Microsoft, right? Like you, you get your CSS, you, you didn't even have animations, so I don't know how that thing was even moving. Um, but uh, yeah, so what is interoperability? And we, we kind of set up a cheesy mission statement, but it, it, it really helps us focus our, our energy around uh, how we build the product. So it's the web needs to just work. And for everybody, and that and that's interesting for us because it's important not just for our users, it's important for developers, but it's also important for businesses, which uh, Microsoft caters to a pretty good bit. Um, so what does that mean? Well, okay, I'm a browser engineer. I look at code on websites daily, so I read all your code. So I see your hateful comments against IE, uh, and and. I still sleep at night. Um, but no, really, so the funny thing is, I actually showed this slide uh, once before, and there's this block of code up here, uh, and, and I tried to make sure you couldn't tell like what website or I, I took it from, but it's got you know, a variable like var, I, I hate IE, and I had this code up here, and for the first time ever in my life, somebody interrupted me in the middle of my talk, and I was like, what? Uh, the guy that wrote this code happened to be in my audience. Uh, <laughs> And he works for like a top 100 website, and he's like, actually, this code is no longer needed anymore for Edge, so it kind of made me really happy. Um, but this is you know, really the context that we started out to, to fix this problem. Uh, you know, whether it's you call an API and it throws an exception when it doesn't in any other browsers, or you use some particular layout technique and it's off by five pixels and you just don't know why, and, and you, know, you throw in some hack or you disable some feature or you sniff the user agent string, uh, you know, you do something, and we wanted to. The goal here was that it not just work, not only just work for users, but that you're running the same code in our browser as you are in any other browser, and that's for Internet Explorer a tall task. Um, and so that task actually, for us, starts with getting the right modern content. Internet Explorer versions actually trained developers to just stop sending the same markup, right? It's just this assumption that it would just not work, right? Uh, so this was, you know, maybe a year or two ago. Um, like, this is the same website, same URL, loaded in Firefox mobile, uh, Safari mobile, and IE on Windows Phone. Uh, you get three different websites, basically, here. And this is you know, a huge problem. And so in order to you know, get our, our users the right modern experiences, like the first step for us was just to get the right content. And that actually turns out to come down to largely the user agent string. So I want to talk about user agent strings here. Uh, I've put a f uh, you know, Firefox, Safari, Chrome, and Edge up here to compare. And uh, Patrick Lauch, who's a, a colleague of mine, works on some standards with me, he likes to call the user agent string a pack of lies. Um, and it really is. Uh, all of these are lies uh, <laughs> in the user agent string. So every browser says it's Mozilla 5.0. Um, we tend to be like some gecko, and you know, uh, Safari's got origins from KHTML. Apple WebKit is in the Chrome UA string for some reason. It's also apparently Safari. Um, and and so Edge starts to pull in all of these crazy keywords, and it's like, why do we do this? And it's because uh, we needed to peel back an onion. Basically, the first step of that onion was give us the same code that you're sending some other browser, and then let's see what breaks. That's the only way that we can find out the real problems in the engine, right? Like if if we find out like the code that you expected to work 
run it in our engine and see that it doesn't. And then you peel back that onion and you just go, oh, okay, we need to have uh, WebGIF refixes, or we need to have um, this standard, or we need to fix this bug, or, um, and that, that's kind of the iterative approach that we've had um, over the last couple of years building uh, Edge. These all trace their origins back to crazy places. Uh, and the funny thing is like, does anybody actually even know what Mozilla 5 is? Like what, what, it, what it was? It was like Netscape Navigator. <laughs> so like none of these, they all have it in there. I was actually having an interesting conversation the other day about like, can we just finally get rid of this? And it turns out, no, you really still can't remove this from the user agent string, which is kind of sad because if you think about that, if we could remove those characters from every HTTP request across the web, we'd like save a bunch of trees and stuff, right? Like bandwidth galore. Netflix would be really happy. Um, the HTML5 standard even actually says you're supposed to do this. Uh, so like navigator.app codename is a constant in all browsers, Mozilla. Um, we, we say our product is Gecko. Um, and th this is rampant. And it's all because we need to break the web to fix the web, right? We have to get the right content to know how to fix the engine to make it run the content that's actually out there. Um, this is real. <laughs> I read a lot of code. This is a if mobile check I came across uh, a couple months ago. This is over 2,000 characters of regular expression. Just to decide if you're mobile. And if you wrote this up in IE on Windows Phone, it's not mobile apparently. Uh, we still got it wrong. So um, this is the kind of thing that we're up against with the user agent string and, we, and it's, it's, it's out there. Um, so I, I, I'm here to like pontificate and just say like, hey, don't, don't use your agent string, except remember I said I was a web developer and I, we've all been there where we're like, it's like your mom tells you to eat your vegetables, but you know, when you get older and you're like, oh, tonight I'm just gonna have, you know, cake. Uh, I'm looking at you, Ray. Um, but uh, no, really, the real reality here is, is, is avoid it as much as possible. You do have to use it sometimes. Sometimes you can't feature detect, right? Um, and so the, the tips that I have here for kind of not being broken by user agent string changes in the future is to you know, search out feature detection, uh, behavior detection. Um, there's really, I love, uh, if you read through some of jQuery's code actually and see the places where they've had to get really creative in detecting whether you know, a feature is there in IE 7.0 or whatever, um, you can actually, by looking at some of that code, you can learn some of these really cool uh, practices for detecting behaviors and features. Um, and there's lots of great content out there on learning how to do that. But if you find that you can't do that well, or sometimes the case is you can't do that performantly, right? You, the code to actually detect the problem is expensive. Um, then, and you have to use your agent sniff, then try to sniff for a particular version, right? Look for the particular version that you know has a problem and that you're trying to fix. Uh, assume that unknown browsers are good. Uh, assume that they have your latest modern experience, so that way, if something like Edge or Vivaldi or any of these you know, upstart browsers comes along, your code at least gives them the shot of, of running the modern web. Um, so this is like a non-scientific proportional-ish graph of the intersection of the rendering engines uh, across four of the mo most popular browsers. Um, and you can see there's a good bit of overlap here. Uh, and there's this interesting phenomenon where, uh, you know, as you'd expect, Chrome and Safari, who draw their origins from a similar code base, they've forked off since, um, have a tremendous overlap because of that. But what's really interesting is, is because of the dominance of Android and, and iOS on the mobile web, that there's actually this huge section of the, the pie graph over here that is necessary for running the mobile web that is not truly interoperable yet, as in across browsers and standardized. So when we forked the engine, we created a new, like, completely separate code base from, um, from the Trident engine, as it was called. Uh, the first thing we did was delete all that crap. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, but the focus of interoperability was, let's go do the other stuff, right? Let's go do the things standard, non-standard, de facto, that makes the web work, right? Um, and there's a lot to go do there, and so we needed to prioritize within that. And so I wanted to give you some insight into how our team thinks about the, the work that's up against us. We have, you know, we've made significant progress, and we have even more to do. And so I want you to think about how we prioritize stuff. So we came up with these kind of four classifications. We, we call it interop 0, 1, 2, and 3. They're not very clever names. But interop 0 is this case where 
you had something that worked in IE 11, and then we changed our user agent string, and we removed code, and we did all kinds of crazy stuff, and now it doesn't work. And then we got to get those working, right? Like if, you, if you're a user and you have Windows 7 with IE 11, and you upgrade to Windows 10 and you get Edge, uh, you hope that stuff that worked keeps working. So that's obviously an important bucket. The next bucket where we focused a lot of our intention, and I think where you're going to see the most value, is Interop 1. And Interop 1 is where we actually collected data about what sites were really using. And we found the, the, the bugs where sites were working in other browsers and not IE. Uh, two is where we see stuff that is not available, was, was not available in IE, is available in other browsers interoperably, but the web's maybe not using it yet, or but we think they will be very soon. Um, and uh, three is that like off on the horizon, ooh, new shiny idea that just came up in the W3C, and we'd like to get started on that early. Um, and so this is kind of the way we, we prioritize things. And I'm going to give you some examples of the types of things we're fixing, because uh, they all characterize a different type of issue. So uh, font resource handling. The W3C spec at the time that we implemented font trace and all this stuff um, required that fonts, if served cross-origin, had to have a, a cross-origin header, right? Had to have a cores header. Uh, and IE actually implemented this. Um, turned out other browsers didn't, which meant they were allowing fonts to load that technically the spec said you weren't allowed to load, um, which causes problems like this. This is the Hawaiian Airlines site. I showed, which had icons uh, next to their menus that just didn't show up. Um, and so, uh, let me flip here. Uh, and so that's something that we relaxed to be interoperable, and actually the specs are, are, are starting to change around here, um, as well as the licensing bit, if you're familiar to that, with like uh, some of the font formats. Uh, that was another one we changed here. Uh, this one's interesting. So that was a case of something that, like, um, in that case, surprise, surprise, IE was following a spec. Uh, but it was causing problems. In this case, here's an API that's not in a spec. Uh, this is WebKit appearance. This is non-standard. It's a thing that showed up in Safari one day, and then uh, Chrome got it because they forked off. And, uh, and it turns out that this is in use in a lot on the mobile web, right? This is so you can get rid of things like the drop-down arrow on a select control. Um, and so we just implemented it. Um, and this, you say, well, this is kind of subtle. Like, maybe, maybe you know, web developers should just use standards, and, and, and it's bad of Microsoft to go support this kind of behavior. Well, it turns out to actually really matter. Um, so this is a worse version of that. Same, same bug, same uh, API. And if you don't have that API, you get the left screen. And if you do have that API, you get the right screen. So let me know how I was supposed to choose my gender in IE on Windows Phone. <laughs> Whoops. Um, so these things really do matter. Um, gradients, this one's fun, because uh, I, I worked some on the standardization of CSS gradients, and uh, we went through lots and lots and lots of different syntax proposals and the spec change. And we, well, inside of WebKit, um, there's actually three different versions of the syntax that are supported. There's the standardized linear gradient syntax. There's a WebKit linear gradient syntax, and then there's actually an even older version of WebKit linear gradient, and all of these things work. So we found this was kind of the next layer of that onion, right? We, we knew WebKit prefixes were all over the mobile web, and we just had to do it. And we originally thought, like, well, maybe we'll just alias them, right? Like, we'll just slap a WebKit in front of the ones we already have, and things will just magically work. Um, and what we found was actually a lot of these are way more complicated than this. You have to go in and do work to support new features like appearance or new syntaxes like this. Um, and, and it changes the user experience uh, in some cases dramatically. Um, and there's a lot of usage out of this on the web. For example, WebKit border radius, border radius, which was like unprefixed in like IE9, uh, is still at something like 40 or 50 percent of page loads in Chrome. Um, that's crazy. Like, and I don't mean they also had the unprefixed one, I mean pages relying on it. Um, uh, but then we just have straight up bugs. Like, I'm, I'm not going to lie here, right? There's just lots of crazy stuff. This was a fun one that I um, uh, participated on. Uh, the inner HTML API, which ironically came from Microsoft um, and was later standardized, um, if you 
set it to blow away, say, uh, on, a, on a parent node, right? You set inner HTML to an empty string. Um, it would blow away all the children, right, in the page. But if you had a reference to one of those children uh, early on, and you went and looked at it, you could still see what the subtree looked like. You could go inspect its inner HTML. Not naive. Um, didn't work. Um, and this caused lots of bugs. It's all over. There's like a million dupes of this on Stack Overflow. Um, and we fixed this. Um, and this one's interesting to me because this was one of those cases where without forking our engine, without actually taking out our code base where we didn't have to worry about legacy Internet Explorer behavior, uh, like preserving emulations of that if you're familiar with document modes and stuff, uh, by forking, we could say, you know, to hell with legacy compat, we can now go fix things like this uh, without a worry of breaking, you know, IE8 parity or something like that, which was a problem for Internet Explorer. So there's these different classes of types of issues that we work on, and like bugs where we're just plain wrong, like the inner HTML one. Standards we're missing. Uh, there's, I'm going to talk, I'll, I'll dive into some of the stuff that's here, but there's, you know, there's a bunch of standards that, you know, IE11 was a good browser, but it was missing a lot of stuff. Um, unstandardized stuff like WebKit appearance, or did you know meta viewport's actually not standardized? Um, uh, de facto differences from standards. This one's a cool one. Uh, the meta refresh tag, uh, you're supposed to be URL equals uh, foo.com, but it turns out some browsers support it without saying that, and so you need to support that in order to make meta refresh work. Or if you, the, how about the casing of UTF-8? This one's a cool one. That broke Hillary Clinton's website. Um, uh, but another interesting aspect of the way we've rethought how we approach this problem was also bugs in other browsers. And uh, so I'm actually not really a stranger to you know Google or to Mozilla or Apple because we, like I said, we actually all get along very well. And one of the things that we've been trying to do more of in the last year is help them identify bugs that are actually causing problems for other browsers. So for example, um, if let's say a particular browser has a bug, and that's your browser of choice for doing your initial development. You will code through that bug unknowingly, right? Like you might, if, if, they, if that browser has that layout bug where it's off by five pixels, you actually assume the five pixels is correct, right? And then you, you adjust it and you tweak your numbers. You don't really know why, but you push it to production and it's all good. Um, but then that becomes the expected behavior, the default behavior, right? And so. We've been, uh, you know, we've actually been working in other browsers' code bases. Uh, we've also been helping them prioritize bugs, and it's actually a really cool relationship that we have, so that we can drive cross-browser interop across um, uh, across browsers. So we've made like, ooh, getting trigger happy here. Let's see here. There we go. To date, uh, this slide is going to be out of date. Actually, we've made over 5,300. Uh, of these types of interrupt fixes. And what I mean, these aren't all of our bug fixes, these aren't all of our features, these are just things that actually affected real websites. Uh, and, we, uh, and we did this based on patterns. And um, let's see, here we go. And I mentioned removing code. That actually also improves compatibility. So we've removed a ton of like legacy IE isms of the past, your attach events, VML, VB script, uh, conditional comments, um, a bunch of IE layout quirks, current style. I like started naively to make this slide, and then actually took a look at all the stuff that we had removed at that point, and, and realized maybe we should make a list and just kind of remember for a moment, take take a moment of silence, everything <laughs> that was gone. This is just the IDL. This isn't the implementation. This isn't the code. This are just API names of things that we removed from Internet Explorer that are no longer there in Microsoft Edge, and I'm gonna have to keep talking to make this work long enough so that we can get to the end of the slide. Whew. And you know what this really does? You know what the best outcome of this is? Like, developers love deleting codes. So we have a really happy engineering team right now. Um, okay, I won't make you watch all of that, but there's um, um, uh, over, uh, let's see, over 330,000 lines of code have been removed uh, from our engine at this point. Uh, which is pretty pretty awesome. Uh, and so how do we decide to do that? Like how do we prioritize these things? I mentioned like a, some loose buckets of like affects a website, like doesn't affect a website. Seems popular, might be popular in the future. Those, okay, those are good, but when you deal with 33 trillion sites, you gotta do better than that. So, um, you know, in the video it was mentioned that we used to look at just top sites. We would do, um, we would hire um, uh, test engineers to do 
you know, just literally go browse the web. That sounds like a fun job. Um, and, 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 and check out compatibility on, say, the top five, 9,000 websites. And we just hoped that that meant the rest of the web worked. Um, and, and it really doesn't. Um, so we, we actually have taken to heart, we built an, uh, a very large data science and telemetry team that's helping us guide how we make these fixes. Every single one of the fixes that we make is targeted and, and intentional and prioritized with data to back it up. Um, and that starts with the Windows 10 Insiders program. We have uh, about 4 million uh, people trying out Windows 10 with Microsoft Edge right now. And we're collecting all kinds of awesome data that helps us fix things. This is real data here. Um, so one of the things, one of the simplest things that we did um, uh, was we put in the little send a smile thing in the, in the um, browser UI. So there's a little button. You can send a smile when something works well. You can send a frown when something doesn't work well. You know, we have to keep it simple where, you know, hundreds of millions of people can understand the concept, right? But it turns out that with just a little bit of data about, like, say, what site they were on when they clicked that button, uh, we can learn really cool things like this developer that checked in code this day should probably be punished. Um, and uh, so we can find instantly in real time when we break something and, uh, and, and prioritize accordingly, and, 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 um, and that's really powerful. We also have this other cool thing called Bing. Uh, it knows about 33 trillion pages out there, 44 billion sites that those are made up on, and the browser has over 7,000 different APIs. So we said, why don't we take Edge, wire it up with some special instrumentation, and go run it inside of the actual Bing web crawler um, nightly. Um, and we could stuff that data based on what APIs get called, what um, you know, uh, syntaxes, what markup, what, the, what image formats, what video formats, all this stuff into a database. And we could use that data to make decisions and, and as a feedback loop back into the product. Uh, and I'm going to give you a real-world example of how we did that. Um, so XPath. XPath was one of those standards um, that uh, Internet Explorer doesn't support. Um, and uh, it's, there's, there's no work really being done on a new XPath uh, implementation. And our, our kind of position, our point of view, if you will, in the past was, you know, CSS selectors are way fast in browsers, and you can do almost all of the stuff that you would do with XPath with CSS selectors. Like, web developers should just be using uh, CSS selectors. Um, well, it turns out that was pretty naive, because there are real bugs here. So this is TomTom. Tom. Uh, if you don't have XPath, you don't know what the cost of the item is. Whoops. Um, or how about, um, I think this is a Brazilian lotto. Uh, yeah, I need the lotto numbers for this to really be helpful. Uh, so XPath turns out to be important on the web. So we had this hypothesis, though. We're like, well, you know, if CSS selectors are, there's a huge overlap in terms of capability with querying elements with XPath, what if we just, like, under the hood, took your XPath query and rewrote it into a CSS selector? Didn't tell you about it, but just did it that way. Like, wh what if we just did that? It would be a cheap way to go implement this feature, and we could go focus on newer, cooler, shiny objects out there. Uh, so like here's an XPath query, uh, you could go change that up into a selector that looks something like this. So we did that, we just prototyped it really quickly, and we threw it into that instrumented build uh, that runs inside of the Bing crawler at night, and we said, how'd it do? 94%, 94% of the web's XPath queries could actually be rewritten to CSS selectors, and so we sort of patted ourselves on the back, like, yeah, we were right, no. Um, but 94% doesn't mean the web just works, right? You need to do better than that. So we, we, we made some optimizations, uh, and we got it up to 97%. We said, pretty good, pretty good. But if that in that 3% is like the beer of the month club that I participate on, I'm going to be really mad when it doesn't work. So like we, we got to get this right. Um, and so we did something kind of interesting. We looked to JavaScript. So. Um, we took this selectors engine, which is implemented in C++, which was giving us 97% uh, compatibility. And then we picked up an open source library called Wicked Good XPath. Um, and we built a thing that we call internal JavaScript. Internal JavaScript is like implementing a feature inside of the browser, but under the hood, it's really implemented in JavaScript instead of C++. Uh, and um, 
We can pre-compile the JavaScript, so you know the uh, JavaScript engines actually do just-in-time compiling normally. Well, in this case, since we know we already have the JavaScript, we're not waiting for it to come across the network, we can pre-compile it so it's fast. Um, and uh, we stuck that in there, and it covered the next 3%. And so that is actually how XPath works in Microsoft Edge. It is a CS CSS selectors engine plus open source JavaScript. There were a couple bugs in the library, so we decided to con contribute those back and fix them. Um, and uh, and so that's kind of a cool way that we were using data to approach um, implementing features in, in our browser. And there's all kinds of examples of this uh, daily. And um, so the other side of this, not just fixing bugs or, or implementing uh, you know, uh, older standards and things like that, was communicating that to web developers. You know, the biggest pain in the world was like we, were, we held the cards close, right? And when Internet Explorer was being developed, you didn't know until a beta at best showed up whether a feature was going to be there. I remember um, <laughs> kind of laughing. Uh, it, when we worked on IE9, um, we, one of the betas shipped, um, I think, SVG support uh, early. And everybody got excited. It was like, yay, finally, you're getting with the times, you're implementing SVG. And then everybody freaked out because they're like, wait, but what about Canvas? Um, and we were actually working on Canvas. It just wasn't ready yet. But because we had these crazy you know, closed proprietary um, you know, policies, we just wouldn't tell you that, but why, right? They're, these are interoperable things, they're standard things. You could literally go actually write maybe a script that goes and looks at the emails each like company sends to the different working groups in the W3C and instantly know what they're working on, right? You can just see, oh, they're all of a sudden working, uh, asking lots of interesting detailed questions about Canvas. They must be implementing Canvas, right? So this was kind of a silly way to approach engineering uh, something that is based on standards. and so. That was the other significant thing that changed in this last year, building Edge HTML. Um, there are a lot of W3C specs out there. I edit uh, a number of these. I've, I've written a few. Um, and um, stuff like the HTML5 spec itself, if you print it out, it's like 700-something pages long. Don't, don't do it. Like those trees that we're going to save by getting rid of Mozilla 5 just like died if you did that. Um, but with a spec that long and a, and a, a platform that complex with over 7,000 APIs, um, it's no wonder that these you know, interoperability differences can exist or, or that people read the same line of text and interpret it two different ways. Um, and so we, we, in order to give us more insight into how we were approaching these, we, we launched a platform roadmap. So this was actually like a side project for me, uh, status.modern.ie. Uh, is the, the URL for this uh, right now. We're, we're, uh, we're moving it into a new Microsoft Edge-centered uh, homepage uh, soon. Um, and this is just a list of standards. It's a list of specs and, 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 and things that are out there. There's like 200-something specs on this site. And what it tells you is what was supported, like, and if it was supported in Internet Explorer, what version. It tells you what we're currently writing code for right now, uh, what we're implementing next. Um, it tells you uh, what's in preview builds uh, of, of Edge, and it also tells you what we're considering for implementation beyond that. Um, and this is not just to help prepare you and know, okay, I can anticipate that I can count on you know, CSS transforms preserve 3D being in Edge. It's also so that if you think we're making the wrong decision about prioritizing work, uh, you can give us feedback. Um, and so this is a graph of how the progress over the last year, um, where the red bars are features that are available in, or new features that are available in Edge. The, the purple bar there is um, features we're still working on, uh, and the blue is, is stuff that we're tracking for, um, for possible implementation beyond that. And we've made like pretty tremendous progress. There's over 45 new web standards in Edge, which is more than any other IE release ever had compared to the previous one before that. Um, and so this is a list of some of the highlights, and I, it's kind of an eye chart. Um, things that stick out to me that are kind of fun and interesting. Um, pointer and touch events are there. Um, Gamepad API. Uh, web audio uh, is there. Yeah, you also have access to you know, webcam and mic through uh, get user media. Um, and ES6 to boot, we actually have the most ES6, uh, uh, most highest percentage according to like uh, uh, Conjex's 
tables um, of the ECMAScript 6, the new version of JavaScript, uh, out of any browser right now. Uh, we also actually are um, uh, winning at the, the performance benchmarks right now, too. So there are a lot of great JavaScript stuff out there, um, date input types, um, and uh, parts of specs that we implemented and didn't finish. Uh, so CSS 3D transforms, we implemented those, but kind of left out preserve 3D, which if you ever have to do like a rotating cube or something like that, you'll learn it's like abysmal in, in IE, um, but it works in Edge because of preserve 3D. Um, we also have new formats, stuff like even older stuff like motion JPEG or wave audio um, works now because that turns out to be useful in these media um, contexts. Um, uh, let's see, streaming, uh, the stuff that's not on this list, Dolby Audio support, uh, encrypted media, uh, streaming capabilities, HLS, Dash, if you're familiar with video streaming, um, those things are supported. Um, a lot of great stuff here. I won't read the whole list. Go check it out at status.modern.ie. Um, and then you're going to say, but I found the thing that you're not doing or you don't have yet that I want you to do. So let me talk about how we think about what we're doing next. Um, I talked about real data. Um, right now, we're focused on making the web actually work, which means you're going to see us do more stuff that doesn't seem new and shiny. You're going to see things that we're choosing to do because we want to make the web work, and it's based on what real sites are using out there today. Um, you're, we also take in developer and partner feedback. So on the left here is a screenshot from uh, uservoice.modern.ie. So this is a place where you can go vote. Uh, you can submit new ideas. You can vote for ideas on features that we should implement. And we kind of take this you know, petition style in the sense that things that get a significant amount of, of uh, you know, upvotes, we, we go and have engineers, uh, you know, not business people, not marketing people, they go in there and they write you an answer about, like, here's what we're thinking about right, uh, with this particular feature today and what we think about the roadmap for that in, in our browser going forward. Uh, so that's a significant way. Standard stability is also something that we take to heart very important. Um, we have lots, Microsoft has customers that run mission critical stuff. We're talking nuclear power plants, we're talking all kinds of crazy uh, systems out there, hospitals and whatnot that rely on the web browser. And so one of the things that's important to us, even as we ship faster, is, ship, is shipping with stability. And that means that we're sure that someone's not going to walk into a W3C working group one day and say, you know what, the Flexbox API should probably be renamed. That happened after people had shipped it. Uh, and so we don't, we don't want to you know, throw a website under the bus or throw your hours of engineering that you just spent implementing a new standard if it wasn't ready. And so that's something that we take into uh, consideration. We're also an engineering team. We, we more than doubled our team in the last year, uh, and uh, yet we can't do everything. Uh, we also have area experts, right? So we might, if we have a guy implementing CSS filters, we're probably not also implementing blending modes because it turns out we want the same graphics expert guy working on that, right? Um, so these are kind of things that come into play in how we prioritize, and it gives you a little bit of uh, uh, behind the curtains, you know, how, how, the, how the sausage is made. Um, uh, but the biggest thing here is real world usage and developer feedback. So I would encourage you to go out there and, and, and send us feedback um, on our plan, on what we're implementing, uh, and what you think we should do next, what the problems you're seeing, uh, the good things you're seeing. Let us know. Uh, and there's a lot of great places to do that. I mentioned user voice. I mentioned status. Uh, um, Ray's going to talk a little bit later about a cool thing we have called remote. Uh, um, and you can grab the Windows 10 uh, preview builds at insider.windows.com, which has Microsoft Edge in it now. Uh, it ships next, uh, next month. Am I in the right month? July. Um, <laughs> uh, and we're also in Twitter. So like all of our engineers, like if you go MS Edge Dev at MS Edge Dev on Twitter, those are engineers. Uh, you'll get real responses. We'll follow. We'll we'll dive into your Stack Overflow issue, your GitHub repo, and help you out. Um, so with that, um, I'm Jake Rossi. You can follow me and ask me more questions. And uh, I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Yeah. Thank you, Jacob.